welcome uh, to everybody, a particular welcome to our author, uh, the renowned author Josephine Roos, and welcome to our members of our two sister societies, the Anglo-Swedish Society in Gothenburg and the British-Swedish Society in Stockholm. And also a welcome to the members of CELTA who are joining us, the Swedish-English uh, Literary Translators Association. Ooh. So, well, um, Josephine uh, grew up in, sorry, somebody's should mute actually because of a bit of feedback if you don't mind me saying so and, and i also want to say we're recording this and if anybody has a problem with being recorded maybe they could uh, turn their cameras off and mute themselves um, josephine grew up in a very well-known uh, academic family in lund uh, but she very soon decided uh, that uh, she needed to kick over the constraints of lund and was heard to say, uh, Lund er så lite och valden så stor. Uh, I don't think I need to translate that. So uh, I just think even the world was a bit small for her. And um, if you get the opportunity of reading her really lovely children's book, um, if you can't see the title, Er jorden stor eller liten, um, you will see there that the grandchild of the narrator, if I could put it that way, asks about the meaning of life, uh, the implications of death, about travel. But the uh, really important thing for me is it gives the title, the child is told that even the world is a tiny space. It's just a speck in the total universe. So as soon as she graduated, Josephine uh, decided to go to Spain and to earn her living dancing in a nightclub, which was very convenient because it meant that she could write during the daytime. And that began her passion for Spain, for Hispanic culture, for travel and for mysticism. The uh, book that she's going to talk to us about mainly this evening is Svartsvarna, sorry, I'll start that again, Svartsvarna, but she's also going to talk about her life and about some of her other books. So it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Josephine, and she's very kindly said that after she's spoken, she'd be happy uh, to answer some questions. So Josephine, the floor is yours, and if I say, if I could ask people, who are not speaking, uh, to turn their cameras off and to mute themselves. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. That was beautiful. I think you make me sound far more interesting than, I'm, than I actually am. <laughs> so let's see. There you go, you can see, right? Absolutely. Good. So I grew up in a very academic world that was learned in the 80s. And uh, we talked a lot in school about all people being equal and nothing about climate change. There was a lot of snow in the winter and no snow in May. There were no problems that couldn't be fixed. And uh, I had friends with parents that had come from all over the globe. Um, my father was a very, very famous chemist and um, books, libraries and literature were always in reach. Uh, I always wanted to be a writer, to survive death, I suppose, not that it's possible. And I have written every day in my life. This is a picture of my mum, the same day she came back from the hospital with my brother. My friend Sara is there and my younger sister and she's reading to us. And they always read, my parents always read to us. Books were very, books were always very important. And they used to read to us long into our teenage years. It's not, it's no secret that writing starts with reading and the love of language. 
Uh, one week after I graduated from school, I went to live in Spain, as you said, Robert, where my first job I found, the first job I found was as a nightclub dancer. And within that profession, I traveled Spain from coast to coast for three years or four years. And on that experience, I based my first novel, Helio Threw Up, that came out in 2006. And I remember sitting on a beach in Almeria, in the south of Spain, writing on a piece of paper. Um, but after that, I returned to Sweden. I moved to Stockholm and I got a degree in Spanish, English and literature. I worked for five years or so as a high school teacher. And then I moved to England with my partner, who's English, by the way. And there I suffered a major hemorrhage. The doctor waved it off as just a flu. He ordered my boyfriend to get me a bottle of Lucasade. And you know, you all know what that is. And the following weeks, I was in a coma-like state. The first year after my hemorrhage, I barely could remember what I had eaten the same day, what I had done or said. And I was working in a garden center in Essex. And I remember my boss turned to me and said, but Josephine, I just told you five minutes ago. My friends were amazed and my bosses, they were so upset with my lack of devotion during that year. I remember being in the hospital for some treatment when my first editor called to say that my first novel was going to be published and I cried. I was so relieved. And then I was 26. Uh, a few years later followed my second novel, Kura Schimni, about three people in the north of Sweden in Jämtland that discover that their children have got an imaginary friend in common, a girl that they knew when they were kids and that died 28 years earlier. I was very influenced by the magic realism of South America and um, Selma Lagerlöf's ghost storytelling. And I wanted to put my own twist on it. Uh, Kyrachymning is an expression that means to sit at dusk and tell each other stories without turning on the lights. When I became a mother, I wrote two books for children together with my partner, The Journey to the Milky Way and Is the Earth Big or Small? They are both reflecting and philosophical stories about life and death and time and universe, as you said. And there is a copy of The Journey to the Milky Way in English. And I will read you a bit of my English version. I travel on the swan's snug back, then out of the black, without a sound, a face spins around. A nose big and red, it's a giant head. We land on the green silver screen. I jump up and down, a nose like a trampoline. It's the man in the moon, his head like a white balloon. Ouch, why do you people always jump on me? Why can't you ever just let me be? The swan picks me up again and the moon goes back to sleep, resting his head against the universe's deep. Um, and then my next children's book is uh, called Is the Earth Big or Small? And it also wants to put time and place in relation and space and light and darkness. Is the earth big or small? Everything is relative, right? Depends where we stand, from where we look and how we look at something. The way I, the way of seeing the world is very different compared to, let's say, my way of, of seeing the world is very different to compared to, for example, Donald Trump's or a bird's. And this book came out of all the clever things my daughter told me when she was about three, like grandpa is locked in my heart, so therefore he can't come back. Or we all have to die to make room for others to live. Uh, and then my fifth book is a novel for teenagers that deals with important issues like gender equality and young sexuality. It's about a 14-year-old girl who looks around and thinks that 
there are, no, are too many injustices how we treat boys and girls. Uh, I was invited by the Swedish Institute as a part of the Nordic Book Week in London in 2016 to do a workshop about gender identity and equality. And I went around schools in, in Kensington and Chelsea. This simple t-shirt picture is one of the things I talked about in schools. On which side would you rather be? It's so interesting. Kids always have a lot of excellent things to say about this. From my experience, there are one little person in every classroom that goes to school every day not feeling that they can dress or act or look the way they would want to. How sad is that? We talk a lot about how women and men should be equal, but why do we still care so much about colors and clothes? It's just colors and it's just clothes. And I talked to children about Swedish children's books, about strong girls and single fathers. We have a long tradition in Sweden to break the gender boundaries. Astrid Lindgren wrote about the girl who is incredibly strong and Pippi is now 70 years old. Um, Gunilla Bergström still writes about Alphonse who lives along with his dad since his mom passed away. At the same time, Sweden being the most gender equal country on the planet, women do not earn as much as men. And men's violence against women is one of our biggest uh, concerns. Sweden is far from great, because there are no equal countries. And when I taught in London, I found more children came up with jobs that women can't have than they have in Sweden even as police or firemen, which was a bit surprising. In Sweden, the only thing they have come up with so far is penis model. Uh, and um, here I am with Robert in a school in Kensington in 2016. It was a fantastic week. So my latest novel is called Svartsvala, that in English would translate into Black Swift. And it's about a woman called Lucia. Lucia comes with the lights every year before Christmas in Sweden. Luth in Spanish comes from the word in Latin for light. And I wanted to write about a person who brings light even in the shadow of death. After my hemorrhage, I have suffered cancer twice. I have had a lot of organs and tumors removed and I can still suffer another hemorrhage any day. I have learned that life is a very, very fragile thing. So I wanted to tell the story of a person who lives without knowing for how long it's going to last, but that also has got trouble remembering. What becomes time to her? We live in a time where the old Roman motto Carpe Diem is now tattooed in, into our arms so that we won't forget what to do today. What was I going to do today? Oh, that's right, seize the day. But what happens when this self-help cliche becomes a concrete reality, when you're stuck in the moment and can't look back? Lucia is used to living in between with a Chilean mom and a father she has never met. She's already in between two cultures and doesn't feel she really belongs to any of them. When she suffers a hemorrhage, this conflicting part of her personality takes new expressions. She meets a man and has a child by him but she's always in conflict with time and with herself, never knowing what has been said and done. Her memory condition is a dream about a constant now. She's not a reliable narrat narrator. The reader gets confused when the re reader remembers what have happened before in the previous chapter, but Lucia doesn't. I wanted to create a claustrophobic feeling to show just how horrifying it must be to live without remembering. And I'll read you a bit. The memories are not only my past. Without them, I cannot understand what is happening and what will happen. There is no meaning for here and now. I have no real identity. I only have a present without structure. 
I am a before and an after, and soon I'll be gone. Birds are prey, they stress in captivity. A curtain flutters, a child screams, faces they do not recognize. They pluck their feathers, they bite the grids, walk back and forth and then back again. Roll their tongues, chew blank, trim their feathers too much. It calms them. They clean themselves again and again. The feathers fall, fall off in the end. Winged birds can become aggressive birds. The male attacks the female's head. The female cannot escape. escape. It dies in the cage. I am sun and darkness. There are no clouds in between. When you become that dark, no one wants to be with you. The others sit still. Minnen är inte enbart mitt förflutna, utan de kan inte förstå vad som händer och vad som kommer att hända. Det finns ingen mening för här och nu. Jag har ingen riktig identitet, jag är ingen riktig människa. Jag har bara ett presens utan struktur. Jag är ett före och ett efter, och snart är jag borta. Fåglar är bytesdjur, de stressar i fångenskap, det fladdrar en gardin, ett barn skriker. Ansikten de inte känner, de plockar fjädrar, biter gall och går fram och tillbaka och sedan tillbaka. Rullar tungan, tugg, tuggar tomt. Putsar fjädrarna för mycket, det lugnar dem. De putsar sig igen och igen, fjädrarna ramlar av till slut. Vinklyfta fåglar kan bli aggressiva fåglar. Hanan attackerar honans huvud, honan kan inte fly, hon dör i buren. Jag är sol och mörker, det finns inga moln däremellan. När du är så där mörk är det ingen som orkar vara med dig. De andra sitter stilla. I'm just going to turn on the lights again, sorry. In the process of writing this book, I went to Chile a couple of years ago. There I was surprised by just how present Sweden is in everything and everywhere. After the military coup, 50,000 people from Chile came to Sweden. Now the grandchildren live here, but some of them still don't feel Swedish. How long does it take for a person to feel that they are accepted in a place? That's I wanted to portray. The importance of belonging. And Lucia is both divided by her past and present and by her national identity. To not belong culturally, culturally to a place does of course affect you in a lot of different ways. Here is Valparaiso, where Lucia's mom comes from. And here one day I took the underground and found myself looking at all these pictures of Abba and Olof Palme and Anna Lind. It's called Via Suecia. And I went to the uh, El Museo de la Memoria, where this wall full of photos of people that disappeared in the military coup in, two, uh, in 73. Women and children, Victor Jara. The memory issue of Chilean and Swedish history is also a big issue in Svartsvara. But birds don't care about belonging or gravity or nationality or death. The swift flies for 10 months straight without landing. No other bird species stays in the air for that long without landing. Aristoteles thought that they didn't have any feet, that they stuck like spiders to surfaces. The Romans also asked, asked themselves where the birds went in winter. Aristoteles had a theory that the birds turn into other birds in autumn and spring, but that the swallows and the swifts bury themselves in the ground during winter. So I use birds and their behavior as metaphors for human existence. The way we travel and flee and long for other places. Birds have three ways of knowing where to fly. The crystals in their brains guide them like compensies, like magnets but they can also read the light, how it reflects through the clouds. And the third way is that they learn to read the stars. If birds cannot use the sun as a compass, 
they instead learn to find the way by registering the polarization direction of the light. At night, the starry sky becomes their map. They know how to read the star signs. They know that little bear means north. So I'll read you another bit. Mummy, mummy, I am the sun, she laughs. I love her laughter. I lift her up, her lips close to mine. One day I'll tell her about the birds. I will tell you, I will tell her that there is another way of, for the migratory birds to find home. The retinas of their eyes undergo chemical processes when exposed to light. Processes that are affected by the Earth's magnetic field so that they can register the direction of the field. The migratory birds can do all of this without thinking a single thought. What do you do with thoughts if you cannot read the sun, the stars, the earth's magnetic field? When she gets older, I will tell her about the birds. Mamma, mamma, jag är solen. Hon skrattar. Jag älskar hennes skratt. Jag lyfter upp henne, hennes små läppar nära min munvita. En dag ska jag berätta för henne om fåglarna. Då ska jag berätta att det finns ett annat sätt för flyttfåglarna att hitta hem. Deras ögons näthinnor genomgår kemiska processer när de utsätts för ljus. Processer som påverkas av jordens magnetfält så att de kan registrera fältets riktning. Allt det kan flyttfåglarna göra utan att tänka en endast tanke. Vad ska man med tankar till om man inte kan läsa av solen, stjärnorna? Jordens magnetfält. När hon blir äldre ska jag berätta om fåglarna. I wanted to write a book that had the three important P's in it. That was poetic, pornographic and political. With this book I feel I have found a writing that is very much my own. Reading it is supposed to feel like a long inhalation, as my editor so beautifully put it, Lucia never stops to exhale. She's so eager to live that she almost dies trying to seize the day. With my next book, I think I know how and uh, why I want to write. So thank you so much. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you, that was amazing. If, if there isn't a question to start, maybe I could start with the question. First of all, um, to say that it is, I think, a, a most beautiful book. Um, I've been reading it, I have to confess I haven't finished, but um, I've enjoyed it enormously. It, it's um, both touching and gripping and, and really, I would say emotionally challenging. But what does interest me is what made you decide to center it on, if I can call them that's Chilean Swedes. What, what was it about Chile and its relationship to Sweden that particularly attracted you? Uh, I, I grew up in a, in, a, in a place in Lund where, as I said at the beginning, where people came from all across the globe. And the, the, there were lots of people from Chile, but also, and also the, uh, as I said, 50,000 people came to Sweden. So we have lots of that, the, the culture is very present in Sweden. And I, but I wanted to write a book about someone who's been marginalized, uh, both in her time uh, and place. So she doesn't, she doesn't feel that she belongs in time or in place. So, so that's why, why I chose uh, Chile. And because I know Spanish, so it's, it was easier to, to talk about something that, but I was a bit scared of the uh, cultural, what do you call it, cultural appropriation, because I'm not Chilean. And um, that's why I changed, first I made her, with two parents from Chile, but I changed so her father was Swedish because I, I didn't want to step on any toes and speak for someone else. I, of course, I cannot be the voice for someone else. I can just tell a story. 
So that's why. Thank you very much. I was struck by by a lot of your the um, um, the breadth of your of your life and 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 views because reading your book, uh, uh, I don't know what the English translation is on on your intermax. Um, I, I I I would have expected that was my first that was the, the, the where I started um, uh, with with your work. I, I would have expected somebody perhaps a little more. Um, less nuanced actually in terms of because it was written for for for, for teenagers I, I suppose for a certain um uh, a certain demographic um and i would never have expected this to be written by somebody who's done so many different things as, as you have <laughs> you mean work wise well work wise as well um it was it, it was it, it felt a bit like somebody um it, it, it was it's it's certainly a, a very feminist work, it, it, but in in a way that that one perhaps wouldn't have expected you also to have had experience as as a dancer, for instance. Yeah, mm. that's very interesting because my the book I'm writing now is exactly about that. How did I become this dancer? Why mm. and where was I in my life to do that? Because that is very interesting, and it's um my next book is a very big Me Too book, so it's 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 um it draws on experience from from my own life a lot. Yeah. You you certainly haven't been frightened to throw yourself into things, which is uh. No, <laughs> well I have been really scared, but I've done it anyway. <laughs> done it anyway yeah. even even e that that's what true bravery is is to be scared and do it anyway yeah uh, i have a big screen and everyone's nodding and smiling discipline i have a question my, my, michael parsley yes yes hello um i was just wondering how much of how much of your life have you spent in different places um, for instance spain learned uh England, um, because your accent comes over to me as not particularly, not particularly Scanian uh, or or you know. uh -huh. uh, mm. um, Well, my father was from Stockholm, so I've I've always have had this Stockholm accent in the family. Right. But uh, also, if you come from London, you don't speak the typical Scanian accent. There's there are many different Scanian accents. So I think that's why. But I haven't I haven't tried to learn the stuff. I can do the stuff, but um, I haven't tried to. I, I think I try to speak more. Um, as you say in England, you have this um, British that is very how do you say neutral. That's what that everybody can speak, even in Scotland or wherever you can speak this very neutral. And we don't really have that in Sweden. Uh, Riksvenska, we call it, but it's not Riksvenska, it's just Stockholmska. <laughs> so uh, I think um, I, I, I try to pick up accents. It's, it's interesting, where do you put the tongue in your mouth and how do you make the sounds come out? I think British is very open language, whether if you speak American, it's all happening down here. So you can just, uh, you listen and then you learn, where do I put my tongue in the mouth? But um, yeah, I think in Stockholm people say that I speak very skonska, and in Skåne oh, yeah. I speak very well, skonska. I was wondering because um, I lived I lived in London actually for a couple of years um, in the in the seventies, and uh, I had a couple of friends. Um, they were married. She was um, not from from Skåne, I don't think, but he was, but. I think all the all the people from from Lund, you know, for instance, had this very strong Skonsk accent, and I found that I, if I if I persevered in trying to speak with Skonsk accent, I was losing vocabulary because my my introduction to Swedish was in Uppsala, and so that lilt actually helped me with 
words, you know, with vocabulary. And I found that uh, I had to ditch the Skonis accent completely, otherwise my Swedish would just, you know, deteriorate. So um, it was sort of interesting for me, but listening, listening to you, I couldn't, I couldn't say, you know, this woman is from, from Skona. No. <laughs> um, so have you spent, uh, let's say, different, um, different periods in different countries? I mean, obviously you have, but I was just wondering if your life has been five years here, um, 10 years in another place, I no, I, I think I've lived most of my life in Stockholm now, which is so weird. I was in Skåne for 18 years and then Spain for three or four and then England one. And then I've been here. So mostly Stockholm. Right, right. Mm. I'm 44 now, so it's half of my life here. <laughs> right. I see Angela Callahan's got her hand up digitally. Hi there, thank you so much for this. Um, you mentioned about traveling a lot and that your family had a fantastic love of books. Do, what, what type of sort of, you know, uh, favorite writers do you like? Do you like from different countries or do you have a particular genre that you, you particularly focus on? Oh, that is such a good question. I read books. Uh, it's one of my, the jobs that I've got. I review books that come into the libraries from all across the globe. So I read English and Spanish books from Spanish and English speaking countries. So I don't get to choose my, what I would like to read a lot, but I think I like many different, there, there was this one book that came out in England a couple of years ago that's called The Essex Serpent. That is such a great book. It's got everything that I would like from a book. It's Sarah Perry wrote it. Uh, it sets in Essex in, in the, the 19th century. But of course, I like the, um, the magic realists and uh, Garcia Marquez and, uh, and Vargas Llosa and Isabel Allende and uh, the, the ones that came out of the big boom. That's, I think that's, those are the ones that I've studied the most. And Swedish writers, oh, there's so many. It's hard, right? I mean, Selma Lagerlöf is absolutely fantastic. And August Strimba is, of course, a big part of my book as well. I've based this, the title comes from one of his books. So I like to read lots of different books, I think. Maybe not the, the really easy ones, but um, yeah, different. <laughs> And do you read them in, obviously the Swedish you read, but for, the, for example, you said you read the books, do you read them in English or do you read them in the original language? No, I read them in Swedish, but if it's possible, I think that's so much easier because if you read in another language, you're going to focus on the other language instead of what the book's actually about. Yeah. So it's hard. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, Robert wants to... Can I ask yeah. another question? Uh, please. Josephine, when are we going to get a translation? Yeah. Because it, it's uh, really, I mean, for me, it was a very original book. Uh, it, I've, I've not uh, read anything like it, uh, but I would find it a lot easier if I could have read it in English. <laughs> I think that's up to, I don't know, my editor, You, I don't know. <laughs> it, would be good, it would be good to have a translation. Yeah, you have to talk to Bonnier, I think. I, I don't know how that works. I have no idea. It would be fantastic, of course. It would, would be lovely, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question about uh, the book, like uh, Svartsala. And I was just wondering, I, I've read the, the entire book, obviously, and I, I loved it. It was like you said, Robert, it's it's one of a kind sort of book. Um, and I was wondering about the ending. I'm not going to say anything about it to you. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> uh, but I was wondering, did you have an alternative ending in mind when you wrote? Or was it always going to end the way it did? I think um, um, that's a very interesting question. Thank you, Sophia. 
I think uh, it's it it oh it's so hard to talk about without giving it away though. But uh, in a way, it starts with her the first sentence she dies. So does that mean she's already dead? The whole book, maybe. But I also I based this story on uh, Willy Schirklum's book from the fifties. That's called Solange, and. Um, it's about a woman who is trapped in 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 a, in a everyday life that's not for her. She wants to go out. She wants to live, but she's trapped with a baby in the house, and her husband is working, and she's very miserable. So I I based the story on that, and I have lots of references to lots of other books. Of course, every book is a is a. Um, a conversation with other books. You can't write without um, having read a lot before and understanding that you write because you're in this circle of discussions with other authors that's been there before you. And that's, they've said everything already. So everything has already been said in literature. Everything's been written. So you have to consider yourself being a writer, I think, in a constant dialogue with other writers before you. So I thought about having another ending um, because I wanted to have another ending, but then I thought it's not possible. So no, it had to end this way. Thank you. Uh, did, did, did David have his hand up at some point? Go yes, I, I did actually, sorry. I, I mean, um, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. It certainly has been very interesting and stimulating actually. And that's what I've been pondering about because one of the things you were describing was the impact of, um, let's say, people having to move across the world, either voluntarily, you've done that, of course, in your life to, to a large extent, but involuntarily, like the Chileans who essentially had to come across when the things were, were very bad in the 1970s, and, and then try to recreate their life in a completely new environment, which, uh, I mean, Sweden's got many, many wonderful qualities as a country, but it's not an easy place perhaps to start again, I think it's fair to say. But then it, another parallel, a parallel with that really struck me because you've also got this considerable interest and, and depth of thought and analysis around things like gender identity and mis, misclassification, for want of a better word. And in a sense, it made me think about, a, it's another sort of a journey. You can have the sort of literal journey of moving around the world, but perhaps that side of things with gender dysphoria is another sort of journey, but not necessarily one where you know where you start and know where you end. You do, if you leave Chile and you come to Sweden, you're pretty sure what that journey is going to be like. And I think that's a very interesting parallel. That's why I've been sitting for the last 15 minutes trying to think it through. So I think that's a very unusual perspective. At least that's what you suggested to me. I don't know whether you think I've imagined that you didn't really think that, but I, I picked that up, I thought. That they are both journeys, different. Yes, ways. yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but also I think I want to write about people that are being more, more, more how do you say, margin, marginalized? Marginalized, yes, yes. Yeah in different yeah. ways because yeah. um, that's where you find the interesting stories and also the people that you want to lift up like this girl i thought there haven't been a lot of books about lesbian teenage girls there aren't at least not in this country so i want to fill the gaps in the in the bookshelves that that needs to be filled so that's yeah. why i wrote but and also because i thought oh my god the children they grow up with so many stupid differences like these t-shirt prints but it's so ridiculous as i said it's just words it's just colors what do they mean why can't a boy dress in a skirt who cares <laughs> it's just a skirt we don't if it doesn't hurt anyone why can't we just let our children be the way they want to be I just going to also say um, welcome uh, Pierre Lundberg, who um, from the Swedish Embassy, from the the the, uh, the culture section, uh, who, uh, who who we, we managed to send the link a little late, so so she was a couple of minutes late. I think it was our fault. Welcome. Thank you so much, and thank you, uh, Josephine, for your uh, 
really inspiring and, and gripping talk just now. I'm, I'm pleased to meet you, although it's just on the screen. And uh, also very much looking forward to reading Svartsvala. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was your predecessor, Pia, who introduced um, Josephine to me. Uh, yes. We, we, we had that sort of wonderful uh, period of uh, Scandinavian, Nordic, and it, we stretched it to the Baltic literature for the children. And um, it, if I can just sort of tell this rather silly story about uh, when one author went to the school to uh, talk to the children and um, I started off by saying could somebody tell me where Sweden is so the hands went up and I said right um, you're the first where is Sweden and this child said it's next to Switzerland which uh, is a fairly common belief and the, the next one had an even more interesting solution. He said it's part of the Canberra Capital Territory. Mm -hmm. Now that takes really quite a lot of imagination. <laughs> and there was this little girl who put her hand up and she said, I know, I know. And I looked at her and said, um, do I spend? And she said, yeah, oh, yeah, it's Svensk. And of course she knew exactly where it was, but she was the only one in the class who did. And that's really uh, part of what we were doing. We, we, we were sort of um, introducing children to uh, Scandinavia and Sweden. And I, I went to another event and some child came up to me and said, excuse me, sir. She said, which was always very good. She said, that lecture that we had at my school was the best day of my life. So it just shows that, you know, um, it's never too young to start and talking to children about literature and talking to children about experience uh, is just so worthwhile and you know again it's some time ago but thank you very much Josephine for what you did at that time in addition to everything else and I have to say um, probably of all the speakers we had you made us think because, <laughs> which is one thing you've always done actually because I think we you um, can I say this? I don't think I'd offend you. You disturbed our comfort zone. And that was good, actually, because it's very easy to uh, sit back and think that your world, your bubble, your life is the only one. And to have somebody who disturbs that and says, look, you know, there is another way that there are people who are uh, trapped in an identity and you want to think about them and you, you want to help to get them free. And I think that's something which was very valuable. Anyway, it's five years ago, but um, I think we benefited a lot from it. It was one of the best weeks I've ever had. Just <laughs> going around Kensington and Chelsea it was fantastic. I still can't believe I did it. But that is such a great thing to say. Thank you. Disturb our comfort zone. If I can go back to the previous question, that's what I want to do with my books disturb the comfort zone, to make you think, why do we care if a little boy has got a dress on? Why is that important? Does it hurt me in any way? Can we just let him be the way he wants to be? Can we just let people feel that they belong to a country that they've lived in for 30 years? What's wrong with that? If they bring us fantastic culture that we can take into our culture and just this, that's exactly what I want to do, disturb our comfort zone. Thank you so much, Robert, that's so true. Well, no, I found Svartsvala actually disturbed my comfort zone too, because, um, well, I've never read anything like it. And I mean, that, that, that is meant to be a compliment. It re really, it, it, it's original. Um, it, it disturbs your views of society. And the fact that you have a character who lives in the present and has no past, no real past, is actually quite disturbing. Mm. And she's very um, out, outgoing as well. In the, she's very much in your face, so she's a, she's a bit um, too much, I think. <laughs> well, I do think, and I mean, there's, there's this lovely scene 
where she tries to get her um, child to uh, make friends with her new friends um, children that you know, absolutely rejects them. It's such a familiar scene to all of us, you know, come along and behave and talk to so-and-so. Mm -hmm. Don't you ever do that to me again, honey, because I'm not putting up with it. Sorry? I said, don't you ever do that to me again. Don't you ever... Uh -huh. <laughs> I will. <laughs> If we cast our minds back, I'm sure we've all been placed um, as children at the random children's table. Uh, I, I remember ending up at the children's table at 15 with a bunch of eight-year-olds because we were all the same as far as the adults were concerned. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's surprising as well as if you go, if I go around schools in Sweden, we don't have this uh, dress code like you do. It's so different in England. And I asked the kids in London, why, why do you dress in a, in a suit like that? What do you call it? Um, uniform. Uniform. And they said it's because, uh, so, the, so if we get lost, <laughs> we can just ask for directions and they will know from our little sign which school we belong to. So that was so sweet, the answer they had to why they have to use this uniform. Um, of course, that's not the reason why they dress in uniform, but um, it's it's so far away from the Swedish way of thinking that you would have to go to work dressed the same every day and use this uniform. But there is a more social reason for uniform, and that is that it it overcomes the discrepancies of dress. So, if a child's parents are wealthy, or a child's parents are poor. Yeah. They're all dressed the same way, and they're not wearing um, expensive five hundred dollar trainers. Yeah, wearing the uniform, and I, I do think that's actually good. The other reason, and I won't say which it is, a school, which I think you might have gone to, I'm not sure, where I used to be a governor, and the head teacher brought in uniform, so that the pupils who misbehaved could be spotted easily and dealt with. <laughs> When they went into shops. When they went into shops, shops and heaven knows what we misbehaved. And some of them, shop, shall we say, borrowed a few things. Um, uh, they could tell exactly where they came from and tra track them down. But um, you're right, actually, uniform is a very English, mm. very English activity. Yeah. And also, I think in Sweden, instead you would think, how do we not? How do what do we do to help so these parents can buy the kids clothes instead of saying we should put the uniform on the kids that don't have parents that can pay for them? It's just such a different way of mindset, I think. But it's also a question of unifying, isn't it? Yeah, that, that is that is a, a problem also that you raise. Um, some parents find it very difficult to afford the uniform. Um, and it's not all that expensive, but it's too expensive for some parents who really are having quite a difficult time. And um, the schools, when they can, help, uh, and some of the charities help, but you, you, you don't realise just how marginal some people's existence is, that they can't, yeah. relatively small amounts, mm. it's called uniform. Mm. And sometimes, I think that people don't realise a lot of the children are not even brought up by their mothers. They're frequently brought up by their grandparents because the mother has decided to move off and do something else. And the grandparents are usually elderly and don't have the um, income to afford things. So whereas uniform um, doesn't, doesn't make the child seem different from anybody else. They're mm. just all part and parcel of the same school and, and I know from having worked in the social social services uh, it's quite terrifying actually how the poor people really feel the necessity for a uniform because they don't want to be um, pointed out as being different I think that's absolutely and right. that's what they really care about I think that's right mm. but um, it was I, I don't want to sort of get off the subject of the book which is really what we're, we're here to talk about, but it was actually um, funny that you should have raised the point when you went to the school where I was a governor, 
of um, the girls wearing trousers. And of course, that's one of the things which the government decided the girls should not be allowed to do. The girls wear skirts, boys wear trousers. And <laughs> I think you found that um, really rather surprising. Mm. Yeah, ridiculous, really. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go to work in a skirt every day. I absolutely agree with you. Mm. You don't normally wear skirts, so you don't know at all. Me? Yes. <laughs> I've never worn a skirt, no, it's absolutely true. Not even a Scottish one. <laughs> no, but I mean, coming back, I really do hope um, that we manage to get a translation of the book. It, I think it would be so worthwhile. Mm. I would really like to see it. I don't know if, um, ju just to ask, is Hannah Charlton with us? She was going to join, but I'm not sure if she's with us. Is she with us this evening? I can't, I can't see her, no, I've been looking I at her. I can't see her, but for those under, of you, under another name. Under, under an anonymous computer name. No. But her review in the Swedish book review, which you haven't read, if you haven't read, do read, uh, is an incredibly well-written and interesting review. And um, I would like to thank her in person for it. I, I believe we have a link on the website and there was one in the newsletter. So uh, do, do click on that, that's a very good one. Um, po possibly a slight uh, possibility of a spoiler in the, in the in the last paragraph. I'm not sure, <laughs> but uh, definitely um, uh, very complimentary. Um, may may I ask you something, Josephine? Um, you having lived in a few countries and uh, being married to an English man, but now living in Sweden again, and talking about uh, disturbing comfort so zones and so on. Um, would you say that um, the tolerance for, for example, as you mentioned, a boy wearing a skirt at school or, or wherever, would be bigger in some countries? If you compare England and, and Sweden, for example, Mm, absolutely. I mean, yeah, maybe not England and Sweden are very good examples, but I did find that in Sweden, the kids, uh, as I said, they are much more tolerant to women working with whatever they want. And also um, the dress codes are not as strict. I'm not, I'm not sure what England is like now, but um, I think we are ahead in, in, in many ways when it comes to thinking that it's just kids and who cares, as I said, who cares? Let, just let them be themselves. And as I said, there's always a little person in every class that comes up to me afterwards and says, I go to school every day in this uniform that is not me. This face is not mine, this, dre this dress code is not me, but um, it's what society want me to be and it just it breaks my heart because why do we care so much why do the adults care so much so i think sweden is way ahead of most countries but um yeah i was surprised in england by some comments but um of course i can't apply that to to everyone but on the other hand um i feel I, I moved to, to London with two, two young teenagers and they were struck by the diversity of the city and that actually people dressed and looked in very different ways, you know, and much more so than in, in Stockholm where we used to live, mm -hmm. where in their school, everyone was competing uh, with the the right type of jacket or, or um, winter shoes or preferably really expensive ones and, and it was almost like a competition and they came to London and they in the beginning pointed, uh, pointed out people on the tube for example saying that look at that man he's wearing a bright yellow suit early in the morning or that woman she must be 80 and she has pink hair and that's cool and that's different mm -hmm. so in many ways I I felt that in their eyes there was an openness to 
looking different and, and being perhaps different as well uh, to a greater extent than, than in, in Stockholm. Mm. Yeah, I think Sweden has changed a lot in the last years. It was different when I grew up, very, very different. And London is, of course, it's as diverse as it can get. People from, can be from all kinds. So it's so diverse. So yeah, uh, London is, of course, far ahead of, <laughs> of Stockholm, yeah. Uh, we're very grateful as ever to, uh, to Robert for coming up with a, a wonderful um, idea for an event and introducing us to Josephine. And, and above all, of course, um, thank you so much. I think a lot of us will be trying to uh, read a, a, as much as possible of what, uh, what you've written. Uh, do you know, is, is um, Svart Swala, is it, um, has it come out as um, a, a, um, an audio book yet? No, it hasn't. No. It's, uh, no. <laughs> Gonna to have to talk to my editor. Yeah, audiobook is is uh, is, a, is a great favorite, especially in the original language. Mm. Actually, Alexander, um, I was just wondering about that myself because uh, audiobooks can be a bit of a danger, can't they, for authors? I mean, what you do if if somebody reads your book and you don't like the way they they speak it or they they don't pronounce certain words properly. Um, what can you do? It's already done. The contract is signed. Yeah. And, and you've had it, really. Mm. Yeah. Oh, unless the author is, um, is a good reader. I think sometimes it, if, if the author themselves reads the book, it can be quite... That's what I was going to... Can be rewarding. Or, 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 or if you can get Stephen Fry, which is tough. <laughs> That would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I have written to him because we are at the same publishers in Sweden, <laughs> but he hasn't wrote, written back to me. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, he, he's probably the best uh, audiobook reader I, I, I've, I've heard so far. <laughs> but, um, well, just to say, well, thanks thanks all, all round and, um, and um, I hope to see you next time and every time, all of you. And we, we hope Thank you. Lucy will be joining us in the English. Yeah. Week. Ah, yes, yes, indeed. Very well, um, very well pointed out. Um, we would like to um, invite you to become, um, uh, give you a complimentary uh, membership, um, uh, really uh, to say thank you, uh, and also as, as a cunning way of, of keeping you in the fold and, and, uh, and keeping you informed and, and, and enticing you back to, uh, to join us on future occasions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, I'll take that as a yes then. That's yes, a absolutely. <laughs> in that case, uh, Lucy will be in, in touch and, and just, to, just to find out what your preferred email and, and, and how to keep in touch best. Okay. Well, so thanks. Thanks. That's all from me. I'm not going to turn um, the, the channel off if anyone wants to chat. I'm just going to uh, say uh, night night and turn my particular camera off. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.